Yeah, cool. Welcome to today's Cosmos Science City. Cosmos Science City is a collaboration between the Royal Institution of Australia, which is the publisher of Australia's largest and uh, premier science magazine, Cosmos, and cosmosmagazine.com and the three leading public universities here in Adelaide, the University of Adelaide, the University of South Australia, and Flinders University. My name is Matthew Ward-Ages, and I'm a journalist here at Cosmos, and I'll be convening today's panel. And you're all on the wrong side for me. I need you all there, so I don't need to keep turning around. We acknowledge that we are here today on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay our respects to elders past and present we recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship to this land. And we acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living here today. And we do extend that respect to other, other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations here today. Before we get underway, should you need to use the facilities, you'll find the restrooms out that door and via the corridor that uh, will open up in front of you. Um, women's closest, men's further along. And if there is a need to evacuate the building, an alarm will sound and we will ask you to carefully make your way out of the building the same way that you came in, which is into exchange place outside. Should you require assistance in such an event, someone from the RI staff will be available to help you. Now, today marks the start of World Breastfeeding Week. It runs for seven days from the 1st of August every year. And it is a global campaign to raise awareness of themes related to breastfeeding around the world. For decades, breastfeeding has been recognised as providing ideal nutrition for newborns, contributing to lower rates of infant morbidity and mortality, and improving overall infant health. This year's theme focuses on improving conditions for breastfeeding enablement within workplaces around the world. And here in Adelaide, researchers across our three major public universities and SAMRI over on North Terrace focus their efforts on a range of themes related to breastfeeding and optimising infant and parental health. We're joined by four of them here today. So I'd like to welcome Associate Professor Wendy Ingman, excuse me, who's a breast health researcher leading multidisciplinary studies in breast development, breastfeeding and breast cancer, and has provided expert advice and education for a number of national organisations, including the Australian Breastfeeding Association and Breast Screen Australia. Today, she'll be discussing the biology of breastfeeding and her research into lactation mastitis and low milk supply. Professor Annette Briley, a nurse and midwife and clinical academic at Flinders University and the Northern Adelaide Local Health Network. She has worked on many clinical trials which have changed clinical practice, including pregnancy outcomes for women with obesity. Today, she'll be sharing her research into the unique importance of breastfeeding for heavier women and their offspring. Cassie Whitworth is a lecturer in midwifery at the University of South Australia. She has been a midwife herself, a lactation consultant, and a parent, excuse me, parent educator for many years working in public maternity cares and related sectors. Cassie has recently completed a master's exploring women's experience of online and antenatal education, which she will share with us today. Cassie also has a strong interest in developing digital capabilities, rather digital health capabilities, and better understanding how to meet the needs of women engaging with online platforms. And Dr. Amy Keir is a consultant neonatologist at the Women's and Children's Hospital. She's also an NHMRC Early Career Fellow at SAMRI and the University of Adelaide, where her research focuses on improving outcomes for preterm babies through closing the evidence to practice gap. She'll be discussing that as well as a recently commissioned trial she is co-leading at SAMRI into the impact of donor milk on moderate to late preterm babies. Welcome to all of you. And Wendy, we'll get you to kick us off. Um, sure. Um, well, thanks for the introduction, Matt. And hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Wendy. I'm from University of Adelaide. I'm based at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Uh, so I'm a breast biologist. What is that? Uh, so I study the cells in the breast and how they interact with each other and how they coordinate the amazing process of making milk and a whole lot of other range of different processes that go on, including the development of the breast during puberty, how the breast cells change during the menstrual cycle, and then also then how they coordinate to 
to produce milk, um, and also how um, they can also become uh, cancerous and we um, lead to increased risk of breast cancer with these changes that occur. So I'm just fascinated by biology. I think it's amazing. You know, the more you know about your body, the more impressed you can be about it. Um, you know, we made up, our bodies are made up of cells and they all work together to make you, you. And when I study breast biology, I learn more and more about how the breath works and I just become more and more impressed. You know, if you think about it, our bodies can undergo this massive change during pregnancy to acquire the ability to make milk and um, feed our, our infants for their first, um, you know, first part of their life. So um, I actually wanted to kick off with showing a video. Um, if you could just have it off on the screen, but don't play it yet. So this is what I'm talking about when I say how amazing the breast is and how the more we know about it, the more amazing it can be. So these are um, mammary cells, breast cells. Uh, this is a video which was made by one of my colleagues, Felicity Davis, in the University of Queensland. But each of those um, uh, red circles is a cell. And in the uh, lactating breast, these cells um, form these round or spherical structures where the milk is made and it goes into the middle of that structure. And then um, when the baby suckles, there is a, um, a trigger that goes up to the brain and then the pituitary gland sets down sends down oxytocin, which is a hormone that then binds to these cells and makes the cells contract over each other and pushes the milk out. And that's what is called the ejection reflex or the letdown reflex. And my colleague Felicity has actually captured this in a video. So all of those cells have been um, made that they will express or they'll, they'll flash up green when they meet the oxytocin and then contract over each other to, um, to eject the milk. So if you could play the video, please. So you can see the oxytocin going over the cells, lighting up green, and then you have these waves of contraction that happen. And this is actually the letdown reflex, which is occurring here. So um, for those in the audience who have breastfed themselves and they, they know what the letdown reflex feels like, this is actually what it looks like. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So, you know, I, I really find biology fascinating and I'm really fortunate that I have a job where I can make these discoveries and look down the microscope and see the world down there. Um, but this is not just useful in terms of our improving our understanding of lactation, but also it can help us improve lactation and understand lactation conditions and how we might be able to treat them so that more women can breastfeed for longer. Um, so the uh, lactation conditions that I study are mastitis and low milk supply. And what we're doing there is we're, we're looking at understanding better the different proteins that are involved in um, controlling how the breast functions during lactation and how things might be going wrong for some women that can lead to inflammation in the breast um, and low milk supply and the pain associated with mastitis. Um, mastitis is a very common disease. It affects one in five women who are breastfeeding. Very painful, very debilitating, reduces the milk supply. And we don't currently have great ways of treating it because we don't understand enough about the biology of how mastitis occurs. And so that's where my research focus is. And we are working with uh, clinical lactation consultants and protein chemists as well to um, identify what these proteins are that can be triggering mastitis and working out how we can, we can dampen this inflammation uh, to alleviate the disease and to help women uh, continue breastfeeding their babies. It's such a fascinating field when you actually remind yourself uh, that it's not just one part of the anatomy at play. Mm. And, you know, to the point of your video, the credit there is for the QBI. Mm -hmm. and so the brain is clearly such an important component of the processes at play. Mm -hmm. how, how much does that need to sort of 
perhaps grow within the field. We're talking about world breastfeeding awareness week. How much does does the public need to perhaps understand better that actually there are a lot of connected processes at play? Within the body, I mean, it's funny because a lot of science focuses on one thing, you know, and we can be a bit reductionist. But when you start looking at all the different components that make up successful breastfeeding, there's so many different aspects to it. And we often focus on one thing, but they are all connected. And it's not just within our bodies, but it's also, um, you know, within our communities as well, our structure of our communities and the policies that we have in our relationships as well, um, all play in together. So, you know, just for an example, um, our research has been focusing on these particular proteins which can affect um, uh, the risk of inflammation in the breast. But these proteins can be regulated by um, stress and sleep deprivation. So, you know, when you think about what's happening in the biology of the breast, how that um, mother is, you know, in, in existing in her environment and how much support she's getting, how much rest she's getting, all play into the biology of, of how, how the, the breast is functioning. This prompts probably a lot of questions. And if you do have one, we'll take them uh, after all of our speakers are presented. And I'll also mention that we're live streaming this event on the Cosmos website. So if we do get any questions through that, we might throw them to the group as well. But thank you, Wendy. And now, sorry to you. Hi, so I'm an African American background. I'm um, so I've done a lot of uh, in, in interventions around breastfeeding and obviously like most midwives um, will advocate that breastfeeding is very, the very best nutrition for, um, for, your, for young children and as the WHO state women should breastfeed for a minimum of six months and then gradually introduce other, other food but continue breastfeeding for as long as possible possibly up to the age of two. Um, but there are certain groups of women for whom it might be even more important. Some of the work that I've done has been with heavier women. So women who have a body mass index of 25 or more, both overweight and obese. Um, and uh, we know that uh, in the, late, the latest AIHW stat suggests that 28% of women in vaginal pregnancy in Australia are overweight and 23% are obese. We can see that actually... Um, obesity or, or heaviness uh, affects more than 50% of women who are having babies today. We know that um, women who are heavier are less likely to think about breastfeeding, to want to breastfeed, uh, to initiate breastfeeding, and those that do tend to breastfeed for shorter duration. There are loads and loads of reasons as to why women don't succeed in breastfeeding. Um, as as uh, Wendy's already said, some of them are, are physiological, some of them are societal and some of them are psychological, um, but these seem to be exemplified or exacerbated in women who are heavier. Uh, they tend to have a delay in, in lactogenesis too, which is a hormone that helps with breastfeeding, which Wendy knows probably far more about than I do. Um, they also have more androgynous hormones, so they have more male type hormones, less female type hormones than leaner women. Uh, and they also have different thyroid functions. So again, it shows this multi-system approach to successful breastfeeding. But we also know that heavier women are less likely to um, be offered skin-to-skin -skin contact with their baby soon after birth and less likely to breastfeed in the first hour of that baby's birth. And we know that both those things are really fundamental to successful breastfeeding. We all know the advantages of breastfeeding for the baby as as Matt has said, but for the mother as well, in the, in the study that we did in the UK, which was replicated here in um, in, in Adelaide by uh, the University of Adelaide, Jodie Dodd's group, uh, that the women who had breastfed for six months or were still breastfeeding at six months postnatally, even if it was only just once a day, they tended to retain 0.08 kilograms, so just 80 grams heavier than their pre-pregnancy weight, whereas women who had breastfed or hadn't breastfed at all or had breastfed for less than four months were just under two kilos heavier at 1.96 kilos heavier. We know that women tend to put on weight in between pregnancy and that actually that is associated, heavier, heavier weights are associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes. So obviously if women can get back into shape uh, quicker, then that's 
that's obviously good for them and their long-term health. There's also, um, we took blood from the women um, at the six month point and when the children, we followed the children up as well when they were aged three to four years uh, and took blood from the mothers then as well. And we found that the metabolome, which is, um, the metabolome is a, a collection of qualitative and quantitative particles that exist and uh, are necessary for healthy uh, maintenance, self maintenance and um, growth and function of metabolic processes in every cell in your body. And women who had breastfed, that were still breastfeeding at six months, uh, had a healthy metabolome both at that point, but that was maintained at age, when their child was age three to four. Interestingly, women who have obesity are more prone to gestational diabetes. We know that pregnancy is a stress test for later life. And uh, therefore, if you have gestational diabetes, you've got a slightly increased risk of getting type 2 diabetes in older age. Uh, there's some work coming out of Sydney currently that shows that women who had gestational diabetes, who, are, who for whatever reason, but including the obese women, uh, they, if they breastfed for six months, they were less likely to get gestational diabetes in a subsequent pregnancy. So if you put those two factors together, uh, if you have gestational diabetes in one pregnancy, you often have it in the subsequent pregnancy. So just not to get it in a subsequent pregnancy is, is quite unusual. But again, it goes along with this healthy metabolome theory. So it may be a really good idea for women who are heavier to breastfeed and to breastfeed for longer than, e than it is even for leaner women. As far as the babies were concerned, um, they had uh, better uh, growth trajectories. Um, they had less skin fold thicknesses, they were thinner, they were leaner, uh, they, they had a, better, a healthier at, um, at, attitude towards food um, and to sat satiety uh, than the bottle fed or the formula fed infants. So again, you're looking at the intergenerational effects of obesity, uh, which we, you can't escape anywhere in the news without hearing about that. So um, I think as, as healthcare professionals, um, as friends and family members, people who are heavier, we need to be absolutely encouraging them to breastfeed, providing them the space to do that uh, without the social stigmas. And maybe as midwives and other healthcare professionals working with pregnant women, we should be looking at different strategies to encourage heavier women to breastfeed and to breastfeed for at least six months. So you mentioned the social stigma, and I'm sure that that will come up a little bit throughout, um, throughout this afternoon. But when it comes to heavier women, is is there other research that either you conducted or that you know of that has perhaps recommended some interventions to try and destigmatize that group of people uh, and indeed to encourage you know to borrow your operative word there the encourage breastfeeding with information as to why it's beneficial i think as we're learning more it's becoming more obvious that we really do need to encourage them obesity is almost a pandemic itself uh, around the world. It's not a country in the world that has not got to be um, with the very small microphone. Uh, it's a microphone. Uh, my microphone. Shall I shout? <laughs> 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 okay, thank you. Um, sorry, just suddenly I sounded different. Um, so, yeah, and I, and I think as, as midwives, we have always encouraged women to breastfeed, regardless of... Uh, planned mode of birth, um, uh, any other intervention. I think, Wendy, you would agree, wouldn't you, that as, as part of our, uh, sorry, Wendy, Cassie, um, as it's part of our remit to do that. Um, but I think it is about the social stigma um, that we really have to break that down. There's not, there's not a lot of work being done, hmm. to be fair. We might touch on that topic broadly uh, when we go to questions, but I'll pass over to Cassie now. Have... Sure, um, thank you. Um, so I have, as Matt said before, worked as a midwife and lactation consultant um, for a number of years in the public maternity sector, and then more recently have moved into um, research. So I've recently um, undertaken some um, a small study um, around looking at women's experiences of undertaking online antenatal education, so quite a different perspective from two very hard acts to follow. Um, but under the umbrella, I guess, of antenatal education falls um, breastfeeding education. So looking at how women 
are um, accessing and interacting more in that online space. So we know that pregnant women um, generally uh, enjoy and are generally information seekers during pregnancy um, and within that online environment um, enjoy the flexibility and the accessibility that that space um, tends to offer. Um, and also what came out of um, this work was that there is a, an appreciation for being able to actually build your own kind of self-tailored repository of information that then you can go back to and this idea of kind of content personalization which was really appealing to to women um, and then there was um, the element of interactivity which interestingly enough we kind of incidentally talked about when we arrived around how you um, I guess in this emerging space of digital health how we connect with others and offer that kind of emotional connection um, through digital platforms so this certainly came out as well um, and that women still enjoy that level of interactivity and connection online, um, but more so around um, that sharing of wisdom and storytelling. And that was between midwife, a health professional and woman, but also between women um, and how valuable that was in many instances. But there were lots of challenges as well that came out around um, online navigation and functionality um, and also specifically around breastfeeding education to the fact that when accessing information um, in that online space um, that quite often what was warranted was having context um, and often thoughtful kind of compassionate conversation around that. And when um, there might be less opportunities for that kind of face-to-face -face interaction to occur, uh, there were instances where women were left more feeling stigma and, and shame around choices or uh, past choices and things like that. So that was a really interesting part of it too. Um, so I guess moving forward, it's learning more about how we can perhaps do that in different ways. Another really big part of this too was also um, around the digital divide, which we all know exists around how um, women from more vulnerable and minority populations are more likely to be disadvantaged by that digital exclusion aspect of it too. Um, so I guess the other really interesting part of it as well was around um, health literacy and e-health literacy and starting to better understand how women do look for information, locate information, understand it, and then, then able to actually adapt that into their lives. And interesting that um, uh, everyone is obviously very different with what that journey looks like, despite being on a similar path. So I guess um, moving forward, what it has opened up is um, lots, because obviously it is quite an emerging area in terms of digital health. But the um, space, I guess, for more kind of co-design in including uh, key stakeholders, women, consumers, past users of digital kind of health platforms in being able to start generating some new ideas around how we can move forward and um, best meet the needs of those that are using um, online spaces to access information during what can be quite a vulnerable time as well. And then I guess from that too, uh, what has um, come out of this as well is looking at how we can more appropriately um, and respectfully represent sort of contemporary representations of families and family structures, um, being able to celebrate diversity within that. And then also um, with more of that kind of cultural responsiveness as well. So I think um, almost not a single morning goes by in the Cosmos newsroom where AI doesn't come up <laughs> and digital technology and all the different things it's going to replace. Yeah. When it comes to midwifery, is there is is that a trajectory that perhaps should be considered or do they need to sort of find a way to coexist? I think we're lucky that um, as midwives, we're probably in a profession that hopefully won't be completely taken over by <laughs> um, that however there is definitely some early work and literature coming out around where artificial intelligence will fit within midwifery and certainly this is probably one aspect of uh, learning how we can best utilize it um, but perhaps finding the right balance in how we do that but it's definitely early and emerging in that area. 
Thank you, Cassie. And we'll throw over to you to wrap up for our introductions. Thank, thanks, Matt. And it's been wonderful listening to everyone's uh, research fields. I feel like the uh, slightly more junior clinician over here. <laughs> um, so my background is I'm a neonatologist, so a medical doctor that looks after babies, basically which sounds like an amazingly fun job, but um, there's lots of fun aspects of it. But we do uh, look after a number of babies that are born preterm. Um, so babies that are born before sort of 40 weeks. Um, most of the research in neonatology is really focused on babies that are born very, very preterm. So under 20, 28 weeks, basically because that's where a lot of the sort of sickness and the long-term uh, consequences of being born preterm are. Where my sort of research has come about is about trying to look at how we can better implement uh, the research findings that we know work in, in, in research studies into everyday clinical practice. So I spent a number of years uh, working with my colleagues um, at Women's and Children's and Samory in the Uni of Adelaide, uh, undertaking what, what we call a perinatal quality improvement program, uh, looking at different ways of implementing evidence-based practices. One of the things that really came out uh, strongly uh, in, in that area is that babies that are born what we would call moderately to late preterm, so born between 32 to 34 and then 34 to 30, uh, just under 37 weeks, they're actually the largest amount of babies that are be born preterm. So those really tiny, tiny babies that you often will see in the media, that's actually relatively rare. Um, most families that experience preterm birth uh, have babies that are born a couple of weeks early or a month or so early, and they actually don't get much, uh, I guess, how would you say, not input into the research, but they don't get the research attention. They're sort of seen as you're a few weeks early, everything's fine, you'll be fine. And we actually don't have a great understanding of how we could probably better care for families and babies that are born late and moderately preterm. And what we did do um, back in 2021 was look at the use of donor human milk in this space of babies who are born a few weeks early. So in Australia at the moment, um, most neonatal intensive care units have access to donor human milk. Uh, in South Australia, we access it through uh, Red Cross or Lifeblood, life um, but it's not generally accessible for babies that are born a few weeks early. And, and these are the ones that are more and more common. And most people think, well, you know, they're not really a big problem. They come, they go. But there's actually quite a lot of um, use of formula in this particular group of babies. And, you know, a lot of families and women um, having a baby that's born three term is unexpected, uh, can be extraordinarily traumatic um, as well. And there's not a lot of emphasis put on how can we better support families who experience sort of the more common preterm uh, situation. We sort of started to look around using donor human milk in this cohort to try and better support families who've experienced preterm birth. Um, I'm back, my back, I'm back. Um, <laughs> as a bridge to breastfeed. breastfeed. So originally when donor human milk sort of came, came in, there was some concern that actually would reduce breastfeeding rates amongst uh, women who've experienced preterm birth. But we actually looked at some of our data and we actually showed that more babies who had been exposed to donor human milk actually went home having breast milk from their own mother. So we were able to sort of put that one to rest and actually really now move into this moderate to late preterm space about will donor human milk uh, um, actually help these babies and their families, both in increasing hopefully breastfeeding rates on discharge home, but also around things like length of stay, uh, feeding toler feeding tolerance. So this is a big thing in a neonatal unit. You know, you come out, you're out of the out of the uterus, and you basically expected to digest milk, which is a big ask, right? And there's a lot of theory around, you know, being exposed to human milk would make more sense and be more easily digestible than you know, cow's milk, basically. Um, so very exciting. This week it got announced that we've got funding from the NHMRC to run what's called our GIFT trial. So looking at a randomised control trial comparing the use of donor human milk compared to formula in babies born moderately to moderate and late preterm. So that's being led um, by Associate Professor uh, Alice Rumbold, who's a perinatal epidemiologist, and I'm sort of the a clinical co-lead co uh, hopping onto this very exciting uh, train. Um, and this will be a sort of multi-centre trial 
ideally enrolling over you know well over a thousand babies across multiple sites um big step up from our pilot trial which was just 142 babies so sort of a really exciting area especially if we do show that there there is a difference and also very much looking at a lot of those pa yes patient family centered outcomes so not just like does the length of stay decrease but does this actually improve breastfeeding rates does this improve um, just the feeling within the families of efficacy about, you know, have you actually been supported in, in your yes, bit of a cliche, but journey, but for many families, that's what it is. Um, it's, it's unexpected, unplanned, and, you know, hopefully this will be something that will actually, we'll be able to see that will actually improve outcomes and support families. So yeah, very, very exciting. Um, and yeah, really interesting. Well, interesting to see, see how it goes. Cause when we did the pilot trial, there was some concern I guess about you know would families actually want to use donor human milk it's like oh well, you know you can have donor human milk for a couple of days or formula while we sort of get feeding and other things established but the uptake was really very high and, and really very very well received so quite exciting that after I can only say dog of perseverance by Associate mm -hmm. Professor Rumble that, it, that the trial or trial got up so really exciting and wonderful to see I guess more supported research um, in, in this space around sort of breast milk and breastfeeding. And I spoke to um, your contemporaries at Lifeblood about their involvement in mm. the research this week for a story we covered uh, of the announcement. And you know, I guess the thing that occurred to me when starting that interview is I didn't know that this was in your line of business, Lifeblood. You know, you're not yeah. just taking blood anymore. Mm. Yes. Um, and so there's a massive sort of deficit, probably of public knowledge, which they themselves have acknowledged um, that, that this is um, something that exists. So what perhaps does that relationship with them, I suppose, as the provider of the core product that you are going to be testing? Um, how does that sort of unfold for a person in your position as a co-lead of this trial? As in our relationship with them? Yeah, and, and what are you trying to get out of that relationship in this study? Free milk, kind <laughs> of. Not really. Uh, so in in South Australia, because different countries do it differently, but in in South Australia and Australia, donor human milk is seen as a um, body product. Uh, some places will treat it as a food. So there's different regulations around if you're going to sell basically food. Or, and in Australia, you can't sell body mm. body products, right? You can't sell your kidney. Uh, you can't. You know, you, can, you can't do those things. And having a market for human milk whilst there's you know there's certainly um informal milk sharing and sure there are you know there are instances where people do do buy human milk in unregulated environments um that's obviously within the public health sector and public hospitals that's not not sort of something you you can do so our partnership with lifeblood really is is fundamental to the whole research trial as well as in our provision of donor human milk in the public health care uh system they do quite a huge amount of uh, work around screening donors, supporting donors. So to ensure that um, like other countries where donors are paid, there can be concerns about exploitation in that uh, women might be providing milk, you know, to provide, to get some money to pay for food for their, their home and their child might not actually be receiving adequate milk. So in Australia, you can't, the, the donors that Lifeblood have, they're, they're voluntary donors, they're screened. Uh, they get actually provided with lactation support and um, very carefully selected, um, you know, for altruistic reasons, but also ensure that their own baby is not, not or own child is not, not affected by, by their donation. And I think, I don't, I don't think LifeBuds ever really had an issue with not, not having enough donors. Like I think the generosity of, of families in the community sort of is, is immense um, and it's a yeah, vital relationship of which we wouldn't be able to do, do the trial. Hopefully they'll get some benefit out of it as mm -hmm. as as well because I mean it it is you know to be straightforward it's a potential market expansion for them as as well because the health system pay pays them for the milk it's not something that um, um, like you know it's a useful thing for for, for them as well. Mm. Well, well, thank you um, the four of you for introducing us to your work and. How good is technology? <laughs> um, today, the World Health Organization recommends that breastfeeding is initiated within the first hour of birth, as we heard earlier, 
and that exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of, of life takes place on demand day and night. I am a single man with no children. <laughs> so when you go through doing the research to MC this type of panel, your eyes become very quickly opened for something that, yes, okay, I might have benefited from when I was one year old, but, you know, I haven't really had cause to think about that for some time. And as a man, I probably won't need to, um, you know, look at it in the de level of detail that a new, a new mother or, or, a, or a repeat mother would have to, to go through. I'd also say that that's a pretty good deal on demand um, day and night for the child. That's, that sounds pretty good. Globally, though, 44% of infants under six months are exclusively bred fed, breastfed for the first six months according to the WHO, and it was a further surprise to me, knowing that that was a global statistic, that according to the latest data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, whilst 95% of children will receive breast milk at some point, and that at six months, about 75 will continue receiving breast milk. When it comes to exclusivity, we go from 88% at two months to 66%, so two thirds at four months, and then to 35%, just over a third at six months. And I guess I might sort of open this up to the four of you. Feel free to jump in if you have a burning desire to get us going. But given this data, what particularly in Australia are the challenges to getting those two metrics aligned that not only are children being breastfed at six months and potentially within that sort of recommended first two year period, but also to ensure that that exclusivity rate remains high in line with those recommendations that you've availed us of, the benefits of the health benefits that come from that are, are hard to argue with. Mm. That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things that ties in with the National Breastfeeding Week agenda of the women who have to return to work. And I think, you know, we hear about um, social issues uh, with budgets and things. And, and, you know, some women just cannot have the time away from work. Um, to exclusively breastfeed for six months and I guess it's really important you know I, I went back to work before my children were all six months old they're all grown up now and they're fine um, but um, you know I was very lucky I was a midwife I was working in a clinical environment I had the use of a breast pump I had a private room that I could go to um, even that many years ago but for many women uh, going back to work um, does mean limiting or stopping breastfeeding when it comes to the education component, I suppose, with breastfeeding as a broad topic, how important is it that uh, other people that aren't necessarily needing to worry about it are educated about its benefits and uh, the purpose that it it serves in a, as a biological function, um, as a social function? How is it? How important, I suppose, is it that 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 message goes beyond mothers who are going through that that process to the wider public who may not be perhaps immediately affected by, by the theme of breastfeeding in their lives. I think you said it yourself when mm. you said, as a man, I don't have to think about it. As a man, you do have to think about it because we know that women need their partner's support. They need, they need the support of their whole family. Um, and that includes the male members. You're not excluded from this process. And also when returning into a workplace environment makes it a mm. lot easier if mm. everyone around you is supportive and not left to feel excluded in any way. But I think it also stems back to that continuity of care that happens in the lead up to having a baby and then in that such critical first six weeks to two months after a baby is born with the vast amount of physiological changes that occurs for the woman, for the baby, for that dyad between the mother and the baby and then in that extended family um, to have better continuity and a, a stronger kind of wraparound community support and services available would possibly also assist with longer term exclusive feeding. That's just my midwife yeah. personal <laughs> opinion. When doing some research on the, on the topic for this, um, and for many topic in science, it's always good to do a quick Google of questions to see what other people might be asking um, and to get a sense of what goes up you know, online. And one thing that occurred to me is that there is a lot of information out there 
from a lot of different sources, but not necessarily authoritative. And I suppose when it comes to barriers and potential complications that prevent it from taking place, um, that information is so important. I mean, Wendy, you, you work in the space of investigating those complications at a biological level. How, how important is it that, uh, that there is consistency of information when it comes to potential complications or barriers? Oh, always, I always advocate for good information, you know, quality information to be out there and, and able to be accessed by people um, and, and in different formats as well. You know, we don't all learn the same way. Um, but at, at the, the foundation of it all is actually knowing the information as well. Um, and so there can be misconceptions born out of a lack of knowledge, you know, even in research as well. So, you know, take, for example, mastitis. Mm. We've based our approach to treating mastitis on what worked in the dairy industry 40 years ago. You know, it's sort of shocking, right, to think in about In the dairy it industry yeah, as well. So, yeah. so the dairy industry had a problem with mastitis and they found it was associated with these um, bacterial pathogens like um, Staphylococcus aureus and E. coli. So um, there was a massive changes to dairy industry practices, sterilising milking equipment, um, prophylactically treating some cows with antibiotics, um, reducing herd size or, you know, giving them more space, you know, affect, changing the sort of the crowding conditions. And this had a massive impact on the rates of mastitis. And so there was just this assumption that, oh, well, it's, that's the disease in cows. It's the same for women. Now, women don't share milking equipment. Mm. You know, there is not the spread of bacterial pathogens. There's not the opportunity for that spread that there is in the dairy industry. And it's not to say that bacterial pathogens aren't part of mastitis, but it is much more complicated than that in women. Um, and so, you know, sort of it, it, this has been recognised then through research showing that bacterial pathogens don't play the same role in humans as they do in cows. And yet, because we didn't then have the research to underpin a better treatment, in the absence of that, we've had to just sort of keep going with what we've got. Um, and, you know, hopefully we're now making some progress on that. There's been more interest in, in sorting it out. You know, you look back um, 20, more than 20 years ago, the World Health Organization recognised that the relationship between mastitis and bacterial pathogens was not clear cut as it was in the dairy industry. And yet no progress was made in all of that time. Um, so yeah, we need we need the information, but we also need to actually have the information ourselves mm. before we can start communicating it. There'd be a few clinicians and researchers who would uh, love to work in an industry where you could rely on an animal model, which has deviated a couple of million years ago from us to uh, inform all of your policy making. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, we we use animal models in science, of course. Um, you know, we need to if we want to be understanding or dissecting out the different biological drivers of a disease. But we always recognise it's not the same. Mm. You no, know, there's nothing that replicates humans. We might throw it open to questions from the audience. If anyone does have a question, please uh, make yourself known. And Jess has the mic and will give you the floor. Thanks for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I have a question on does breast milk need to be screened like blood for blood? You know, is there types of it? Is like O, posit o positive? They're universal donors or something, I believe. Is there breast milk? Is it thought like that? Uh, the short answer is no. It is screened from a, so the donors are screened from the perspective of whether they have particular uh, or risk of particular diseases. In, in Australia, the donor, if you donate milk through, through life but blood, your milk's actually what's called pasteurised. So it is, I guess, in one of a better term, like heat treated um, and heated up to a certain temperature that will get, get rid of most, if not all, pathogens. And that, I guess, opens up a whole other thing is what does doing that do to your milk? It does It does certainly change it. But, yeah, you can, like, in theory, any baby could have any woman's milk. So, they, in theory, mm -hmm. there is, yeah. 
It's a good question. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I'd like to butt in there. Of course. Is, I'm not emceeing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd just like to butt in there. If um, And is that why you said there is some trade from other groups um, in breast milk? Oh, about they breast, don't want like milk, sh milk sharing. Yeah, yeah, milk sharing. Yeah, I mean, it's well known that there's quite a lot of other informal uh, milk sharing through either, you know, friends of friends or through yeah. through through the internet. Yeah. Um, as in, oh, as in the, yeah, I mean, that someone, I know in the US, some people have done some interesting studies to show that sometimes that milk isn't actually breast milk, that it's actually been supplemented with, with different things. So, um, yeah, it's an interest, it's an, it's an interesting space. Like I think, you know, historically, you know, there were wet nurses, you know, people would breastfeed each other's, you know, ne nieces, nephews. So, I mean, it, it has been a very much a community thing. So this is maybe a different way of thinking. It's, it's the community that's been regulated somewhat okay i was just uh, sort of using an analogy of um cow's milk where there are mm. groups that um oh, yeah. tra trade um non-pasteurized milk and i thought there might yep. be groups you know in the yeah uh, oh in the community there certainly are, are families and women that, that do milk share mm. yes thank you and so i guess when when it comes to pasteurization it's it's almost like and, and the point was made that um in some jurisdictions it might be treated as a as a body product or yeah. whereas in others it might be treated as a food product and this is also in a way i guess a, a bit of an intersection of the two where yeah. the product that is being used in your trial and, yeah. and for donor purposes is at least treated to remove and make as safe as possible for the recipient yes so uh, the the population that we look at is is theoretically more vulnerable um, to some of the things that can be transmitted um, in in breast milk. Um, so cytomegaly virus is probably the most most common one. Um, and that's why sort of pasteurized milk is is particularly important, important in the babies who are born preterm mm. as well. Any other questions from the audience? One at the back. This is all about breastfeeding, but um, are there any uh, significant improvements in um, formulas? Uh, particular not for preterm but particularly for regular uh, full-term babies that uh, is worth noting it's probably a, a, a good question for, say, for any number of people to, to provide it. the for, formula industries a multi-million dollar market that's very good at mar marketing um, i think at least in my clinical practice i've noted a great expo um, explosion in the hydrolyzed formula and a lot of a lot of pushing about you know unsettled babies try this try this which i think is a very interesting way i think of the formula companies that are getting into that space which is good for them and very very bad for breast breastfeeding human milk is perfect for human babies mm. why would you want to do something that wasn't perfect mm. to sort of draw on the, the the f word that's been mentioned for the first time i think uh, in this session um to those working, you know, in, in a midwifery space, um, to those, you know, doing biological research, how how difficult a barrier is the use of formula to perhaps overcome? Because the WHO itself acknowledges that the perhaps misleading or unethical marketing of formula as a product is a major barrier to encourage more widespread breastfeeding within community. Well, there are very few women who really can't breastfeed and who say, I can't. Um, if a woman, I think it's, it's about maternal choice at the end of the day. And, you know, I, looking around at people here, I can't tell who is bottle fed, who is formula fed, who is breastfed. Well, I'll tell you now, I was adopted, so I was definitely bottle fed um, and I'm OK. So, you know, I think we have to be very careful of midwives and probably doctors mm -hmm. as well, that we don't stigmatize women who don't want to or really feel they can't breastfeed mm. um, because ultimately it's far better that the mother bonds very well with the baby and has a good relationship rather than dreads every time it wakes up and needs to feed so it is it is all a question of balance um, but you know I, I, so I think in, it's a, it's a, it's not a tricky space to to work in because I think we're all pretty certain that Breastfeeding is the best. It's ideal for infants, um, human infants. 
Um, so that is the optimal. But it, we we also, as midwives, we are advocates for our women. So if that's not what they want, then we need to support them to have as good a time as a new mum. And it's a really difficult time when, you know, as we talked about the physiological changes, but, you know, there's you, you, the status change. If, you, if your first baby, you've given up your work and you, you have that identity, you're learning a whole new identity as a mother. It's a really tricky time. So we have to support women to get through it in the best possible way. And when we all look back, um, it's a very short time in our lifespan if we're long, lucky enough to live a good life. Um, so, so again, it's, it's not difficult to, to support women to, to formula feed if that's what they really want. But equally, if they're formula feeding because they've got pressure from family or friends, society or any other reason, um, then we, we owe it to them to give them the right information and to support them to breastfeed if that's what they want to do. I think increasing the duration of breastfeeding is more about policy and providing information than having individual um, women feeling like they must breastfeed at all costs. I don't think that that really helps anyone. Yeah. Do we have any other questions from the room? Jacinta. Um, hello. Um, I was going to ask, so, you know, we're talking about preterm babies and using donor um, milk. That, to me, that obviously means that um, women are not producing milk before the due date. So, but then we also said the first couple of hours, you'd want them to be breastfeeding. So like what time, when does it happen? You know, when do you end up producing milk in that process? So you can actually, believe it or not, before you have a baby, um, and if you're pregnant, you can actually produce milk. So there's, uh, I think there's been some quite big and uh, I guess helpful trials around women who do antenatal expression. That's usually for women who are anticipated to have a baby at term who might have diabetes and things like that who want to have a bit of an extra supply. Um, it, regardless of when your baby's born, you, your body will still go through those um, different changes and go to you know into lactogenesis too and do all of those things. Sometimes when women have a preterm birth, they might be particularly unwell and there might be other reasons why establishment of breast milk is delayed. Um, a lot of the time it's more to do with the, the, the woman who's experienced preterm birth will produce milk and can be supported to do that. But the amount of milk that might be required for that baby as she's establishing her milk supply is, 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 is more than what she's able to provide at that time. Um, some of it's also... I guess, around trying to minimise any possible exposure to formula and also in our sort of, I guess, line of work, it means we might be able to avoid a baby having central lines or exposure to having to have nutrition through the vein if we can use that donor milk as, as a bridge while the woman's being supported to express and build up her own. Right. Um, in some cases, some women aren't able to produce, produce enough, enough milk, but that would be relatively un, uncommon. Um, so. Yeah, still go through still the same changes, still will produce. This is more seen as a as somewhat of a bridge um, in that the baby needs, you know, a term baby can sort of kind of go for a day or two with very, very tiny amounts of milk and, and that's sort of like that's normal, right? But if you're born at 28 weeks or 32 weeks, going 48 hours without having any supply of glucose is dangerous. So you need something there, um, whether that's IV fluids or whether that's donor milk or formula or for some women, they produce a lot of milk very rapidly. I hope I answered that. Any other questions from the room? Uh, I had a question for Wendy. It's relating to um, uh, the hormones for producing milk for lactation. So um, if you are like going to adopt a child, I know some people who are preparing to adopt a baby they would like to be able to have some access to lactation, either with like some support with uh, like a line that the baby can suck um, to get some milk, okay? And I have heard that over time they can make some milk. Well, how does that occur if they're not having the oxytocin from having the baby? You know, if the baby is not born, is there some other hormone at play? 
yeah, so the the establishment of all the, the changes that occur in the breast to enable um, a woman to breastfeed, um, they're really complicated uh, and a number of different hormones are involved. Um, but it is possible, and perhaps not in all cases, but there, there are um, uh, people who are able to acquire the ability to make milk without being pregnant through taking a combination of hormones and expressing uh, sort of, um, over a period of time, their um, breast tissue can actually acquire the ability to make milk. So is some of that to do with like um, nipple stimulation, for mm. example? Yes. Yeah. I'm just saying that because um, I work in remote Aboriginal communities and I've found that um, in young women, like 14, 15 year olds, often they don't produce enough milk, mm -hmm. but um, their mothers or their aunties, even if they're not lactating currently, they will often like put the baby to the breast and um, it seems over time they must make some milk because, yeah. you know, the babies are satisfied, even though they're not necessarily getting a lot from their their actual mother. So these are women who breastfed in the past, but not necessarily yeah. currently doing so. So <clears throat> it's a bit like what we encourage people to, you know, if you don't have a very good supply or your baby's failing to grow, to not let them sleep all night, you know, to like feed um, a couple of times during the night to encourage your milk supply. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so supply and demand. Yes. Um, so the, the establishment of breastfeeding is generally hormonal, but then once uh, breastfeeding is established, then we switch over to a supply and demand system. So milk has to be emptied out of the breast in order for the trigger to go to make more milk. And if it's not emptied, then the breast starts to undergo a process to reduce its amount that it's producing. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Has anyone here supported um, a person to... Not with I have heard reports of it. I've heard the same. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Sometimes in say same same sex couples both mm -hmm. may mm -hmm. may want to try and breastfeed. Mm -hmm. It should hopefully be more mm -hmm. common now. But we will be celebrating diversity, right? Rather than right. <laughs> stamping it out. And on that note, it's just gone 1.30, so that's all we've got time for. But if you do have a burning question that you want to ask, I'm sure that our panellists will be happy to uh, answer it uh, once we finish up. But thank you to each of you for coming along today and, and contributing to the discussion on this topic, which is having a, a major awareness week, as we said. Um, and we'd also like to thank the support of Inspiring South Australia for helping to put on this edition of Cosmos Science City. The next uh, session of Cosmos Science City will be next month on Tuesday, September the 5th with a topic of jobs of the future. And we'll again have representations from universities of Adelaide, South Australia and Flinders for that as well. Um, thank you all once again, and thank you all for coming in and uh, we'll see you next month. <laughs>